Well, Rose, thank you so much for, for joining me today. It's exciting to meet you. I'm sorry we can't do this in person, but it seems like you're in a pretty amazing place to uh, quarantine. You're um, Skyping in from Mexico? I'm Skyping in from Mexico where um, people are quarantining here. They're doing, you know, I went to the supermarket yesterday and you have to wipe your feet and disinfectant. You have to wear a mask to go in. So people are taking it really seriously here, That's which good. is great. Um, but it's, you know, I felt like the political climate in America besides COVID was like, feels like it's giving everyone stomach cancer. And I just thought, I don't want this. Like, you know, and you can pay first, last and deposit almost anywhere. So you're, so in, why not? you're, you're in a secret lair now. Well, that kind of ties in. I mean, what a appropriate time to be releasing the Planet Nine album, which is all about this envisioned utopia and getting off this damn planet and going somewhere more peaceful and more utopian. So um, I guess the obvious place to start is I obviously read the bio and press release that came with the record. And tell me about this place that you envisioned as a child called Planet Nine, this magical place that I would love to visit and that I have visited through your record. I'm so glad you came, Lindsay. It's it's a really <laughs> beautiful place. So I was raised in a Christian commune, Christian. Um, you know, it's all made up anyway, so whatever. But theirs was newer made up. Um, and I was, they raised the children as kind of utopians. What would they be like if we raised them kind of not really being a specific gender and not being a specific race. So I kind of had that for the first 10 years. I had freedom. And when I was 10, I got sent to America and I had a really rough landing. I got sent to a school on a military base and that was um, hardcore and very, very different than the hippie commune that I'd grown up in. Food, everything, loud noises. I'd never, I hid in the supermarket from speakers that had music in them because I'd never heard that before. And I was like, found me on the ground in the frozen food aisle. You know, and then so at school, I was being really tortured by a lot of people because they thought I was weird, which has pretty much been lifelong for me, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm like, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, <laughs> but I created my own alternate planet because I just kind of thought, I don't like this one. And and at the time, NASA was really like, big, like they were sending a lot of people to space regularly. And that was a whole thing. And I kind of thought like, well, if reality is an illusion, why don't I just create my own place? And so I did. And at school, like this orb would come out and encircle me. And I used to sit and wonder about the colors in the sky on my planet and like what the sound frequency would be. And then as we do with imaginary friends, right, or imaginary protectors, we forget about them a lot. And then six years ago, when astronomers actually found a planet nine and named it planet nine, I was like, <laughs> and I know it's like a weird jump, but of course I was like being weird. I was like, I must make music for my planet. And so, <laughs> but also I was doing it at the same time I was writing Brave, my book. And Brave was a really hard, it's hard to call up ghosts, you know, and write an autobiography and a think piece, which is, it's kind of both. Um, but I talk about Planet Nine in it because I wrote the whole album and recorded the bulk of it while doing that. Uh, I did the post, you know, in the last three years, but before that, and honestly, I had no idea when I was going to release it or when the right time was. And 12 days ago, I was sitting here thinking, I was like, we can't travel anywhere. We can't go anywhere. Where can we go that's inside? And I just thought, oh, my God, this is the perfect time to release this. People can listen to it and have a release and, and do some internal traveling. Why did it take five years in the making or five years to put it out? It seems like this has been a very um, long process to get this record out. So it took like three years to make and then like two and a half, three years because I was fighting Weinstein and it wasn't really, oh, here, listen to my songs right now. It wasn't like the time. And, you know, I also have like a skin care line I've developed with my aunt and she's always like, every time I make a ruckus in the media, she's like, I'm never going to be able to release this. And I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I just tweeted about Iran. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I can't help myself sometimes. She's like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know. Um, but it took a long time to release because it just wasn't the time and I wasn't in the right, you know, when you have a 350 pound monster on you with all the other monsters, he's hired to terrorize you for years and years and years. And then during that period, like really hardcore in ways that people can't even imagine. That's why I start that one song, uh, green gold with blade runner dialogue that I've seen things you people can't imagine. Like just like craziness, um, but it wasn't really about that. But it's also about being able to see farther than your immediate pain. And I knew if I could make music that helped soothe my trauma and made me feel like I was in a better place while being on Earth, dealing with all these 
people, monsters, then I know it would work on other people. And, you know, everybody, we have to do what we can right now to help others. It's really incumbent upon us, I think, to volunteer, whether it's $5 to a food bank or, you know, for me, like if you buy on uh, bandcamp.com Planet Nine, a portion goes to COVID relief specifically for domestic violence victims and their children. And so far, just the small amount of money I've made I've been able to house four women and their three children for this month, you know, That's so amazing. it has direct effect. And, but what I can do is I know a lot of people are really scared right now and it's a traumatic time, you know? Um, so I can offer 38 minutes of put your headphones in, shut your eyes, lay down and just travel and just have a, have a moment for yourself. And it's not, I was never good at meditation. I was never good at just sitting there like, you know, uh, stiff and, and sitting. I just, my brain doesn't work that way, but I can do it through sound and I can do it kind of through hypnotic speech patterns and, and things like that. So really it's just, I was like, I think people could use some help right now. And this is what I can offer. How did making this music in the past very tumultuous five years help heal your personal trauma, which you are referring to with Weinstein and other things, but like, it's a very soothing record. There is anger in it. I certainly hear anger in some of the songs and lyrics, but it overall is a very soothing record. How how did it help you heal? Well, it helped me heal like Lonely House. You know, I start, it, there's only a couple, I would say. There's like, yeah, uh, in Lonely House, I started with, are you lonely on your planet? Are you lonely on the fringe? Because I was. And I was a fringe person and lonely as hell. You know, when I was very famous for being on TV and stuff, I was famous for not being me. Um, so nobody knew me uh, at all. Uh, very few people. And then the people that do meet you, they react to you in a way that's not whatever normal is. It's not normal, right? They get this kind of look in their eyes and it's, it's just weird. It's a weird situation. And I was at a 7-Eleven one night, I remember at the height of TV fame, and I had this thought. I had my head down and I was like paying and I was like, I'm the loneliest person on the planet. And the guy behind the counter just goes, you must have the happiest life. And I looked at him and I was like, yeah. And it's just like that, you know, and it, and you know, Oh, poor me. Um, but it is like the golden handcuffs in a way. Like it's a very strange life. It's not normal to have to hire people and spend a portion of your income to hire people to keep people away from you. Yeah. So you're just isolated. Ironic now that we all are, huh? Right. And so I'm kind of good at this quarantine thing. I did it for years in LA, LA and Hollywood felt particularly scary to me and dangerous and, and not safe. Um, so I would, I just wouldn't go out very much. I would just stay in my house and then leave to travel somewhere else. And finally I was like, why am I living somewhere where I have to travel to feel safe and alive? I'll just not be here. But, um, you know, yeah, there is like, in, in the first track, there's like, what's so good? Why do you stay for fear, for love, for commonplace? So that's a little challenging. So I wouldn't say there's rage, but in Cyrene, um, the second track, that song could also be called Me Too because mm-hmm. it's a banger of a beat by my favorite, um, my DJ Falcon who produced uh, my favorite Daft Punk track called Contact and this duo called Punishment out of Paris uh, did the music for it. And the lyrics are very specifically for rape victims and victims oh. of trauma. I know your, I know your truth. I know your pain. I know their lies. I know your rage, but it's all in this like banger beat. And a lot of people don't listen to lyrics, but I think they go into your head anyway. So that's just kind of my love letter to people trying to tell the truth um, and being, and people that have been hurt. But then, you know, you have now you're here, the track after that, which is kind of the most accessible and poppy and has earworm sounds. And it's like, bliss, we ride across all planets. My home is Mars, yours is Saturn. On golden suns and winged horse madness, astral planes, our stars are magic. And it's really just life affirming and self affirming. And Lonely House was like, yeah, people are lonely. Yes, people feel like they're on the fringe and marginalized. Yes, people, you know, and I say in there, the hymn I speak of needs to die. And I then want to ask you about that. For yeah, sure. And then it's H Y M N the hymn I speak of told you lies of original sin and dirty whores, but it's not true and never fair. Think who wins when you're quiet. You know, that's 
it was it's about the power structure and the lies told and how they affect us but in a really gentle space opera beat and um i think with quiet rhythmic hopefully kind of soothing vocals i got a review from variety which was surprisingly okay considering i drag them regularly um <laughs> but they uh, <laughs> They were like, we were, we wanted her to kind of scream or rage or something like that. I'm like, but that's not, that's actually not who I am. I had to do that to fight. I had to be that way to fight because, because righteous anger can change the world. We've seen it historically, you know, righteous justice can change. The power structure can change. We can do this. And I wanted to show you know, people that are thought of as the little people, which I completely disagree with and think is disgusting. But I'm like, you can cut the head of power off. You don't have to bite at the ankles. If you're strategic, like me, I kind of gamed the system. I used the system against the system. But a lot yeah, of people that- I know are shocked that I'm coming out with something hopeful. But I am actually quite soft and quite hopeful. Well, I was going to ask, is that a big misunderstanding about you that you're this a person who's outraged and angry all the time. That is sort of the image that is out there. Right. Um, But it had to be. I had to scare them. I had to scare them. I wouldn't have been effective playing soft, you know. You can look at what feminism's achieved in the last 30 years, and you could say not much. Yeah. And I don't actually even consider myself in that tribe. I I don't ally with any group. And I don't like labels whatsoever. Um, And I get kind of ghettoized into feminism a lot. And I always say, like, maybe I could say that I was in a more educated way, but I was raised in Hollywood. I wasn't reading about third wave feminist history. I don't I don't even know. I mean, I suppose I could Google it, but I don't even know what people are talking about, to tell you the truth. So um, what I do and I think why I make people uncomfortable is because I don't conform to what people think a woman should act like. Yeah. And I couldn't because it's like, if not now, when, if not me, whom, who else could do this? Who else had the insider information, the access to the media who'd been doing for like five years before the expose articles came out, I'd been pushing at Hollywood media, like every three weeks, making stuff go viral. I was following journalists on Twitter all around the world. They would then disseminate my information for me. They didn't engage with me, but people see who's verified that's following them. So I was training them to kind of take me seriously and listen to me. And then Harvey Weinstein and his machine, you know, as they do, they paint you as crazy drug addict whore. That's, that's their whole thing that they have done to women for centuries. She's crazy. Don't listen. Or Mrs. Rochester and Jane Eyre. How do you really know she's crazy? You just have a man's word for it. Right. Stuff like that. It's a very classical way of just silencing humans. And, and I think it's a, I think it's a terrible thing that they do to humans. And I just thought I, had had stuffed down so much anger for so many years in Hollywood. Just keep your nose to the grindstone. Don't look up, download the information, download the data so you can tear it down. Um, it was my day job. I acquitted myself very well, but it wasn't like the love of my life. That work, I didn't, I did, I refused to give up who I was forever just to stay in a system that I fundamentally disagree with that I think is a cult. So is acting completely never again? I mean, I can't say never, but I, I just don't really, I spent so much of my life having to figure out who I was only when I was not working because I was being somebody else all day. Like you go to work and you have your own thoughts and you're talking. If I worked at a bank, you know, I'm doing my job, but I still have my own thoughts when I'm not dealing with customers or something like that. Mine was like replaced with 10 pages a day of somebody else's thoughts, somebody else's way of dressing, somebody else's like thing. And I think because I never had this burning desire to be an actor because I was discovered, I, I just fell into it and two weeks I was starring, two weeks later I'm starring in a movie and it's at Sundance and everything, you know, then I'm on the cover of Interview Magazine and, and, and GQ and all this stuff. And it's like, um, but then I was like, oh God, I don't like this, but now I'm stuck. And then I get blacklisted after being sexually assaulted. And then what job are you going to do? So then it was like taking the dregs and the scraping the bottom of the barrel, trying to get what you could. And that's just a crap way to live. And it's not, you know, artistically where I live. And I think with Planet Nine and with my book, you know, I, I think a lot. And I think about people a lot. And I, I wonder about people and I watch them because I've met more people than most will in 20 lifetimes. 
just but in, in a way, you know, I was thinking of the Wizard of Oz and I was thinking, okay, Hollywood is Oz or the land of Oz. Harvey was the wizard. I was the curtain. Expected to stay silent. The audience faces the curtain. They don't notice it. It's just something kind of pretty there. They watch it. Then it opens. Then when it's tattered and torn and raggedy, it gets replaced. But it absorbs the energy and studies both sides. So, like, I absorbed all the crap from the behind the curtain, and I saw the people in front. So I used to study, like, audience psychology a lot, right? Like, when I directed my movie Dawn, I actually remembered how I reacted to 9-11. Like, my body fell to the ground and understood what was going on before my brain. So I started realizing that with art, you can like start the minute you press play with something really emotional and people won't catch it because then you have the title and they're programmed not to pay attention until you see the title. Um, but I could implant some emotion in them but without them even realizing it. So I do, I use a lot of psychological tools in my work and I did with the mixing of the album, the sound mix, I used um, a cinema mixer, a movie mixer, instead of a traditional pop music mixer. Although for two oh, songs, wow. I used Beyonce's mixer, bangers. Um, but the other ones, the slower ones, I wanted this really big cinematic sound, you know, and, and then we make things sound amazing in movies. Yeah. Um, is Lonely House specifically about Weinstein? Um, that was where my uh, assumption hurt went. Hurt by Beast of No Known Nation. That one. <laughs> That's him, yeah. Hurt, hurt by Beasts of No Known Nation. Hurt by Beasts, No Provocation. Yes. I think that might but be that, too But much. the whole song is not about him at all. Okay. Just those what? two lines. And okay. you know, the, the paradigm. It's bigger than that. I would never make it a song about him. He's not worth it. Okay. But so, I would have two lines in about him, maybe, yeah. So obviously, you never had any concern about, um, you know, you were joking about your aunt saying, oh, you're ruining my chance to promote the skincare line because, you know, you're such a you're loose weird. cannon or whatever. <laughs> you're weird or whatever. I'm not like, a loose cannon. I'm just a cannon. <laughs> okay. Well said. Uh, I guess you never really, because you weren't worried about um, getting work in Hollywood or, or staying in people's favor in Hollywood. Like, do you think that freed you in a way more than other actors or people who might've wanted to take the stance you did, but like, didn't feel they could, you know, didn't feel free to. I think a lot of them are unwitting cult members to tell you the truth. And I know this because I grew up in one and I see the exact same power structure and dynamics there. Don't tell anybody what happens here. We're the best. We know everything. Don't go outside. Um, never tell people our actual secrets or business. Protect at all costs. Um, you're replaceable. You're worth nothing. You're just another one in line. You know, and it's it's like, don't. So I don't think it cultivates bravery there. No, I've just always been kind of weird that way. My dad's nickname for me growing up was the brave one. Um, my sister was the beautiful one. I was the brave one. Um, you know, things like that. And I, I just, I, I don't know. I have a weird superpower and it's being able to cut through the bullshit. Do you ever regret going into acting since it wasn't your like passion and it did lead to some bad, very bad things happening for you to you? I do, you know, but at the same time, I think it was always going to be that way. I think it was always Weirdly enough, my whole life, I was aff I was deathly afraid of being sexually assaulted, as I think most women are, right? It's just a common constant, the guy coming in at night, you know, with a mask on his face and like, oh, that's terrifying, you know, it's the boogeyman. But our boogeyman is usually someone we know, even if it's just at a breakfast meeting, in my case, at 10 in the morning, or it's someone you went out on a date with, you know? Um, they come in all forms. And... I wish I'd gotten out of Hollywood sooner. I wish I had realized I was an artist sooner because I was told I was a commodity. I was sold as a commodity and told I wasn't worth much as a commodity. So in my book, Brave, I write it. I'm like, what if a cigarette could tell you every chemical that's in it? What if I could tell, what if the product that you're smoking, that you're using, the product that's being sold to you could tell you itself what's going on? And that's kind of how I perceived myself. I was like, I am the product. I was the product. I wish... I just got lost for a while. It was kind of like doing undercover work for so long that you just lose your 
kind of your brain. Um, but then I found it again and I kind of wrote my way out of Hollywood. I shaved my head and the side effect immediately was weird was that men and women could hear the words coming out of my mouth for the first time. And I wasn't saying anything differently, but just by breaking the stereotype of what a traditional woman looks like, my voice was heard. And I thought, I wonder if I can do this for other women and other humans without them having to shave their head. I was going to ask you why you shaved your head. Obviously, uh, it's not completely shaved right now, like the way it is on the beautiful album art. But yeah, was was it a whim or what? Was yeah. it a calculated thing? It was calculated in a way. Um, it was a way of like making it so I could not go back to Hollywood. I couldn't like if someone called me with an audition, be like, OK, like it was a hard cut. And um and my hair, I'd always had short hair growing up, and I really prefer it on me. I just, you know, and I talk about hair in my book, because I, I used to get asked all the time when I shaved my head, oh, did you break up with someone? And I was like, <laughs> and from women, of course, saying that all the time. I was like, what a stupid, internalized, misogynistic question. No, of course I didn't break up with someone. But then I realized they were actually right in a weird way. I broke up with the world. I broke up with a societal ideal of what I was supposed to look like as a performer, as an actress, as a Hollywood person, as a woman. I was like, and F off. You know what I mean? It's like, no, I will not. Why do I have to look like what makes you feel better? Was part of your reasoning or part of your desire to break up with the world or with Hollywood was it because of the fact that for so long, um, the tides thankfully have turned, um, that people didn't believe you when you talked about Weinstein or other things that happened to you? I mean, it must be so hard to either be silenced and said, as you mentioned, like, don't say it. Or when you did, people were I like, oh, you're crazy. It. Yeah, And people would say you're crazy or whatever. Or shush. Well, he paid people. He paid journalists off for years and years and years because I never signed a non-disclosure back in the day. And I made him give me a little bit of money so I could have evidence and proof in the future. And I said through my lawyer, if I hear of you doing this to someone else, I will come for you. And of course, then I immediately heard about it. But I hadn't heard about it before I got set up with a meeting with my boss. I was in the middle of my second film for his company. Um, you know, I get asked a lot, do you feel vindicated? Are you happy that people believe you now? Honestly, I don't give a It doesn't matter to me. Because I had to live that way for so long. I had to live with going to a dinner party in Hollywood with somebody, a leering agent next to me going, hey, get any good Weinstein scripts lately? Stuff like that. Relentless to get a reaction out of me. Brutal stuff. Like, constantly. I would go to, say, I remember going to some stupid Vogue luncheon, barf, and um, the actresses scooting away from me. Like, I had a blacklisting. It was like something they could catch. They would just like literally turn their backs on me and not talk. <clears throat> and so I had to make peace. You know, when I came to America, I was relentlessly bullied. Um, and I just thought, you're wrong. I'm awesome. I have just doper <laughs> style than you. It's not my fault you have a mullet, you weirdo. Um, <laughs> like, don't take it out on me because I'm from Italy. And spe I spoke different. I looked different. I wore brown overalls and had short brown hair. I didn't look like what the little girls look like. And so every day they're like, you're the ugliest thing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I would get sent to where my father lived in Colorado and there, and this would be in a transition of overnight, I would go to school the next day in Colorado where everybody would tell me how beautiful I was. And it, I was 11 or 12 and, and that immediately, I was like, well, you don't know me, the beautiful crowd and the ugly crowd doesn't know me. So if I'm gonna survive this world, I have to make what they say about me not, I mean, of course it affects you when you hear horrendous things about yourself over and over. And it's exhausting. I mean, imagine for 22 years, for me, I would say I want a tuna sandwich. And people would be like, oh, that crazy bitch said she wants a tuna sandwich. I mean, <laughs> everything I said was discounted. Everything that came out of my mouth was like side order of crazy because he paid off journalists all over the world to, and he gave them a hit list with a line through my name with a red line saying, this is the number one person. If you ever see their picture, if they're at a premiere, if they're in a movie, savage them especially American journalists. He did it with Vanity Fair journalists. He did it with everywhere, you know, uh, low rent from the Inquirer to Perez Hilton to all sorts of people, you know, um, just relentless stuff. And I was like, I used to like, because I didn't know why it was happening. And I was like, what did I do to these people? I could never figure it out. Now, you know, with Ronan Farrow's reporting, I know why. I was like, ah, okay, that makes sense. Um, but I had to, as a tool of survival, 
like I know the truth. So even if nobody ever believed me, I, and, and they still don't, I could go to my death being fine because I told the truth. I told my truth and that's okay. Well, I need to follow up on something you mentioned about the other actresses in Hollywood shunning you like you had a disease or something that really pisses me off and, and saddens me. Um, so when, after the Ronan Farrow report came out and other actresses started to come out with stories of their own about their own horror stories about Weinstein, some similar to yours. Um, how did you feel? Did you feel like glad that they, that people, more people were coming out and corroborating what you had been saying all along? Or was there any, cause personally I might've, maybe I'm a petty person, but I would have, I would have been kind of angry. I would have been like, hello, now, now you feel it's okay to come out. Why weren't you saying this back then? You know, when it, you know, I was out here by myself. That's how I would have thought. Like, what was going through your mind when right. all of a sudden there was this snowball effect of story after story after story? A lot of people aren't willing to do the most terrifying thing. And when being sexually assaulted happens to you, it is the most terrifying thing, other than death, pretty much, right? Uh, and I think everyone's on their own timeline. Could I think that way and be probably correct in my thinking in a way? Yes, or justified. But I think I have a special weird skill set of knowing that things are going to be really painful and very uncomfortable and traumatizing, but still doing it anyway. And I think others a lot of times didn't even know that they could come out. I think it was more about like someone gave them permission. You know, and they still, like, you know, I would get asked a lot, like, what celebrities support you? And I'm like, what, what, what would make you think that? Um, <laughs> I can say, you know, Uma Thurman um, has reached out several times behind the scenes and been really loving and wonder and concerned. And, you know, there was a time during that three years where my brain broke. It really did. It, it, I actually looked back and I'm like, I, I did have a nervous breakdown. I understand what that term means now. But I would challenge anybody to survive that and not be in a loony bin. Have any actresses um, behind the scenes, I, I guess, or publicly, um, apologized? Either apologized for how they treated you, for not believing you, or anything like that? Or have other people no. in Hollywood done that? No. No. Not a one? Nope. That kind of sucks. I would have expected the answer to be, you know, a handful of people maybe saying like, oh, hey, sorry, I didn't believe you or, or sorry, I dismissed what you were going through. Or It was it was more important people than Hollywood people who did that for me. It would be people with like 43 followers on Instagram and they messaged me. And one guy wrote a really lovely thing. He said, I feel really bad. Some years ago on a post, I said something really nasty about to you and derogatory. And I've had time to reflect since. And. I was being a jerk and I'm really, really sorry. And we still have a dialogue and I talked to him. He's got like 43 followers. So that wow. is who concerns me a lot more. And, and the people I appreciate are not the ones. See, here's the thing. I have insider information. I know these people. I don't want their approval. It means nothing to me because I know that a lot of what they do is not real. And, you know, it's weird. Like the Trump camp, the Republicans are like, Hollywood is a liberal, they're fake, they're blah, 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 they're, they lie, they do bad things behind the scenes, and they're right. Not all of them, I'm sure, but a lot of them. And they're not wrong. They can't see what's in their own backyard, that cult leader too. But the ecosystem there is not run on something called bravery, it's run on fear. And when you have a house, like for me, I had to sell my house. I knew I was going to have to do that to pay legal fees to fight them. Um, I knew I was going to have to lose everything and I was willing to do that. And most people can't or won't, but I'm the weird one that was like, I don't like this life. Why do I want to be trapped in it? Do you think things are better now in the, um, you know, post me Too movement age? Um, and if so, like, you know, do you think things are better for actresses in Hollywood, for women in show business in general? And do you think your outspokenness has played a part in that? I think so. Absolutely. I think yes to all of that, you know? Um, and I think it's, even if they're too scared to the like something on Twitter that I say, but they won't retweet it. I have like, I have like heavy amounts of likes, but very low retweets <laughs> because people are like scared to look like they're agreeing with me or 
allying with me, and this is just regular people too, not Hollywood people, but in Hollywood specifically, I'm glad. I had two young women come up to me on the street the last time, you know, I was there and they're like, we feel safer on set now. Thank you so much. I had a woman writer who's like, I'm in a writer's room and it's the first time I'm ever being listened to. So wow. it, for me, Me Too was not my thing. That's Toronto Burks. And Me Too was very much, did this happen to you, Me Too? It's a language tool. It's a communication tool. And it gave survivors a way to have shorthand to speak about a deep shame that most people stuff down, right? It's not polite conversation. Um, so it, it was kind of freeing. My whole thing has always been, I'm working on a cultural reset, like press the TNT, blow it all up, and then reconstruct it in a more beautiful, healthy way. That's always we, been my goal. How do we do that? How do you well, do you, that? Well, um, I did it by kind of organizing or instigating the articles, you know, that were written, the exposés. I worked on those behind the scenes for a long time before they came out while writing my book and recording my album. How can I do that? Um, I can do it by being a truth bearer. I can do it by not allying to any political party or ideology. I can do it because of how I was raised with utopian ideals. Why not work harder for that? Why not be better? If you can. Do you feel safer now because you know, of everything that's happened in the last coming to light in the last couple of years? Do you feel more healed? I do now. I feel honestly like him going to jail and being in prison. It's the, and I know it's a lot of other women that feel this way too, but I'm talking about me right now. So I feel like I have a 350 pound foot off my back. That's just been like pinning me down for so many years. Just everywhere I turned, he was there blocking. You know, I would go to, I went to a gala dinner in Cannes. They didn't really think about it. And they sat me between him and his ex-wife. And she turned away from me and wouldn't even look at me. And he's like leering at me. And I'm like, and then I had, and this is about 10 years after being raped. I was in Cannes to support a movie of mine. And he sent me Marquesa dresses to wear, these hideous dresses. And I was like, the f I'll take your pink vomit and burn it. Get out of here. Um, it's like, it was just relentless. And it, it was like, he'd let you know that you couldn't escape him. And the things they did to me, like would have, it was hard for me during that period to listen to people bitch about little things. I was like, it just doesn't even hit my meter of things to care about. I'm sorry. I can't talk to you right now. Uh, cause I was dealing with such catastrophically big, like having a spy in my life, secretly stealing my book and recording me. Do you know what the Mossad is? The Israeli CIA? Well, she mm -hmm. was trained by them and was in it. And then joined a company called Black Cube. And he, there was a million dollar bounty on Brave while it was being written. And nobody knew yet. So I was dealing with them flying drones in my window behind my house, breaking in, planting bugs. I had it swept. I found recording devices in there. Um, they stole 125 pages of my book before it was published. The spy who had inserted herself into my life as a friend and, uh, and a fellow activist. And they have me recording and they played it for him. And Ronan Farrow, you know, found it and played it. Uh, they have me saying, you're the only person I can trust to this woman. Oh, my God. But she was secretly a spy, literally a spy. Do you trust anyone now? How do yep. you trust people? How do you come to trust people when these things have happened to you? I don't know that trust was ever in my vocabulary. It wasn't really, um, I didn't, I mean, I grew up in a, a quite dangerous cult, you know, that had beautiful moments and a beautiful educational system and things like that. But it was also a high wire act of safety. And um, that continued to be the story of my life. In Hollywood, you really can't trust anybody. Like, I would have a friend that I had from, for, like, from Seattle, and they would come there, and I would be like, oh, this is my friend so-and-so. And, -so. and they would, then my older friend would say, you know, that friend of yours from Hollywood is really nasty to me the second you turn around. Because everybody would smile at me and be like, ah. Like, so you have no idea. You just don't trust anybody because – if everybody is putting on a weird face because you're famous, it's, it's extremely difficult to find out who's real. So I have, um, three years ago, I gave a speech in India and in Delhi, and I met this wonderful 67 year old woman who's my best friend. Her name is Myra. And then my other best friend is, um, 28 
is Thomas. And so we have kind of been traveling around the world together for the last three years. And they've been a great solace to me. And I trust her implicitly. She's a very maternal energy. And she's always praying to Mother Mary. So she's very spiritual. And it's lovely. And so I have good people in my life. Few, but good. And I lived in London for the last two years. Mm. Um, And that was a really healing place for me. I met outside of Hollywood. I met real people. You know, I met people that cared about me just as a human who, you know, I wasn't um, like England was never one of my strong, most famous places. So it was a lot more anonymous. And I got very involved with the arts community. I did a performance art piece that wound up in the Venice Biennale last summer. And so the arts community has been so welcoming. And I met just amazing humans. And I, and I continue to with my work, giving speeches all over, uplifting speeches. It was funny. When I was in Norway, I gave a speech. And for some reason, I thought it was a women's conference. And I think it's because it was a woman that was running it. So I just internalized my own misogyny and assumed it was all women. And I realized when I got there, it was like 85% men in the audience. And I'm like, oh, my speech. And I just thought, <laughs> you know, then I didn't change anything. I was like, oh, it's the same. Because the first things out of my mouth were, I'm not interested in talking to women. I'm not interested in talking to men. I am interested in talking to humans. Because I think if we can get out of these gender stereotypes and back up to what we were before they told us what we were, then we might have something. We might actually be able to all get along and be freer. You did just say a minute ago that you felt the 350 pound weight lifted off of you after Weinstein went to jail, which, you know, we all applauded. But I seem to recall, I'm not sure at what point during the trial or the trial result, the verdict, you, you, you expressed some, some fear for, for your life that someone was going to come after you or what, what was going on? They were, well, they were, (laughs) it it was just, you know, there was, um, I had a, the, the safest way for me to be is completely transparent. Yes, I've done recreational drugs. Yes, I've done this. Yes, I've done that. Yes, I've done this. Um, just like a lot of humans. You know what I mean? Piss off. Um, so by being honest about it and not being like trying to hide behind a goody two-shoes image, there's not much they can blackmail me with. So my greatest defense has been offense. So if someone's trying to blackmail me in the background, I just come out and say what is what they're trying to blackmail me for. And I'm like, so you can't. Um, It's kind of a weird way to have to live, but ultimately it means you don't have that many secrets. So, you know, you're not like, oh God, what if someone finds this out about me? But were you actually getting death threats, like concretely? Or, you know, like, like actual ones? Oh, I had people try to drive me off the road with blacked out SUVs. Um, In LA I had, uh, you know, there was, yes. It was, it felt, that's one of the reasons I left. It was not safe. I was not safe there. I mean, if you have recording devices that you find in your house and they place a, they steal your headlights so they can place a tracker in your vehicle. These are not good people. No. Well, I'm curious. Ronan Farrow, Ronan Farrow, when he told, sorry, he told um, someone in the government in the Pentagon, he goes, Black Cube, this intelligence firm, Israeli intelligence firm is coming after me. What should I do? And he's like, get a gun. I can tell you they came after me, you know, just as hard, if not harder, than they came after him. Well, I'm curious because you worked with on Planet Nine with so many luminaries like David from TV on the radio and, and the other people you mentioned. Have you felt when you've been shunned by Hollywood, as you talk about, or and you shunned him back, um, <laughs> more accepted in the music world? You know, like, did you have, were people like very eager and excited to work with you? How did you recruit these people? Right. Well, they're all men, if you notice. Yeah. And that's because I reached out to, and maybe I could have kept reaching out, but I just wanted to make it, you know, the album that I wanted to make. But I reached out to three female producers and a female mixer, and they all turned me down. Did they say why? Nope. So I was like, all right. So it's not, it's not really my business why. Maybe they were busy or maybe they just, you know, the public perception. or It's really hard when you're painted. It's crazy to try to do really good work. And these people that I did the music with, um, except for Dave Satek, they were all French, you know. And they're, they have a different taste. And um, I'm quite popular over there and have been for a long time. And they appreciate art and culture in a very different way. And a lot of my weirder movies are classified as weird movies that I've done. They love Um and they, they do accept artists a lot more. Here, I think in America, they vilify them. They're like, oh, you're an artist. You're weird and crazy. We're not going to listen to anything you say. And you're like, well, 
time and eras were meant, you know, by art. It used to be the Renaissance period. It used to be the Cubist period. It used to be this period. Now we label our eras by wars, mm. you know, so, and, and that's America that does that World War One, World War Two, And it's like, that becomes the time marker instead of an art movement. And America specifically is not a particularly cultured place. It's really not. It just isn't. I wish it was. It needs to be better. But it's so young and it's trained to stay there. It's don't go out of here. We're number one. And the only new, like I was just in New York for four months when I had visa issues and I had to go back. And I felt marooned on an island of misinformation. I was like, how do I, I felt like, it, it, you know, that I read this thing recently and it was talking about free press where the press is actually free to say what they really think and what they want and objectively and intelligently. Norway's number one. The U.S. is 54. <laughs> U.K. is 45. Yeah. It's, like, it's like Americans get fed a lot of lies about the outside world being scary to not go there. And, of course, the world can be scary, but it's also beautiful, and anyone can go, and they don't even know. You can get a ticket for, like, $200, $300 and just go somewhere else and, and open your eyes and open your world. And, and culture is people. And the more people you mix with and know, the more free you are just as a person and as a society. So when we keep everyone landlocked in America, because a very small percentage even have passports, um, by telling them it's number one and only showing news about America, there's, there's nothing on the news. If it's about another country, it's about like a terrorist attack or something horrible. Um, if they show Mexicans on TV, it seems in America, it's always the migrants, the poor people trying to get over the wall. Whereas I go to Mexico City, they have 160 museums. It's one of the most beautiful cities I've ever been to, incredibly green. Their love of art and culture is extreme and really intertwined with them, uh, with who they are. And they're, you go to their, if you, you can't do it right now because it's closed, but if you go on Airbnb and put in Mexico City and look at apartments, their design, just their apartments their furniture like it's amazing it's beautiful and that's and and these are a cultured intelligent people there's a lot of poverty here too but there's a lot of poverty in america also but the way they portray everybody and we have the strongest mass media in the world it really does a disservice to americans i think specifically by keeping them scared and thinking everyone's out to get them you know it keeps people small and afraid well, that's worse than ever now because, you know, with yeah. the pandemic, it's being blamed on China. They're saying no immigration. You know, immigration obviously has been a hot topic in this administration. Like, I feel like that kind of xenophobia has got in. Maybe other things have improved in the last few years, but the xenophobia, I believe, has got it's in worse. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the xenophobia was something that was really big when I came to America. You know, and anybody different it just gets, it's, it's a thing, it's this weird and that's this is very cult. Like if something kind of glitches the matrix, like it glitches what their presupposition of the world is supposed to be like, they lash out and they want to kill it, you know? And I bet if all these people that are being xenophobic and ridiculous and harassing like Taiwanese people, because they can't tell the difference or harassing anybody, if they had gone to those places and just traveled and seen the beauty of their country and the beauty of the people, they wouldn't be like that, but they just have had no experience other than what they see on TV here. And that TV is made and marketed to make them scared and angry. I'm curious in that you walked away from Hollywood for all the reasons we've discussed, but you talked about how your weirder films have been embraced in France and other countries, and you now are in Mexico. Why not just continue to act, but like in foreign films or films overseas, films outside the Hollywood machine? I just don't like acting. <laughs> okay good answer. really it was my day job it was a weird day job it was always my day job it was always like oh because I'd been a homeless kid when I was 13 and I, that was a terror of mine for years that I was gonna be homeless again terrified and finally you know I made a fears list and I was like I'm afraid of this this and they were like overriding fears that like drove me and finally I was like what's the worst case scenario that I am homeless okay I'm not schizophrenic uh, I don't have a mental illness. Would I be able to most likely save myself and survive? The answer is yes. And once I gave that fear up, I was able to go forward with my mission. Um, but I do think acting for me, I love directing. That's more of my jam. I love the totality of filmmaking. Um, and I think there's a lot of amazing actors that I respect that are, are true actors. 
<clears throat> I just had a, a weird knack for it and a, it came easy to me. It was kind of a gift. I was like, oh, it turns out, but I'm also really good at tying my shoes and I don't enjoy doing that 12 hours a day either. <laughs> Well, I'm curious in that you 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 made the 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 astute comment that when people think you're crazy, it's hard to make art or hard to like get people to pay attention to your art. How do you think this album, Plant Nine, will be received? Because pretty much when any actor, with a few exceptions, makes music, it's looked at with skepticism, and some sometimes with good reason. Sometimes it's a vanity project that isn't very good. Other times it is good, but it's what always hard. What are you talking about? To- Russell Crowe's band is so good. <laughs> Come on, let's go. What are they called? 10 feet of grunts, feet of grunts. 40 odd foot. Yeah, they're not good. That's a good example of yeah. why no, people but I'm, in general, but I'm also, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm not an actor. And I think I've done enough and proven myself enough in the space as a notable public figure instead of a celebrity um, and somebody who works differently can be perceived differently. And, and again, it's not, I know just from the response I've had so far from people listening to it, it works. You know, I tried it out on three 10 year olds in Ireland, my friend's kids, and they shut their eyes and they went away for 38 minutes. And afterwards, my friend, the dad asked these three 10 year olds how they felt. And one of them said home, one of them said safe, and one of them said free. And to me, that's the best review my work could ever get. Cause that's what it means. So why no plans to perform this live? I did it in a beta form at the Fringe Festival in August, which is a huge, it's the largest arts festival in the world. It's like where they discovered Fleabag. But of course, me being, you know, semi-uncultured American, I hadn't really heard of it. And so one I was, in uh, Edinburgh? Yeah, exactly. And okay. I was like, oh, sweet. They'll give me a stage. Oh, workshop. <laughs> I didn't know people bringing their hard A game there. But I did the best I could. And it was an amazing experience. But I really was kind of jealous of the audience. I was like, I'd really rather be in the audience. And also... I think electronic music, it just sounds better recorded than it does live. And also, I didn't like being stared at very much. And I felt like I was taking away, because I shot all the visuals for Planet Nine too. They're just not out yet because of Wi-Fi issues in the jungle. Um, but I, I played, the visuals were on a huge screen behind me, and I was in the center. But I really felt like I was taking away from my own work. And by people being like, oh, it's Rose McGowan on stage, and like, because I was, it, it just... It worked, but not as effectively as I wanted it to. And I really don't, like my sister Daisy is much better. Like she's like, an, like is good at being on stage. She like, she runs an art gallery and like does big like events for it. And she's just always been like kind of a little star ham. And I just have not been that way. I find it quite painful. Um, like I found red carpets to be just brutal. Like that kind of stuff was hell. Like for me, that really? felt like, like oh. Well, how would you like if you had a hundred men flashing at you, screaming because they're like Rah! They scream at you, so you have these big men, a hundred of them, yelling at the top of their voice, trying to get you to look at them, but your body doesn't understand why it's being screamed at and aggressed on. And but you're there in a dumb evening gown with your stupid hand on your hip. Like I love this, and I'm like, I feel like I'm being shot with guns right now but I have to look and my leg underneath the dress would be like vibrating like crazy because I'd be shoving down a panic attack it was it is fun for some people it just wasn't for me and I'm curious I'm curious then you know I've got to ask if you hate red carpets and being stared at the VMA's dress because that's one of the most iconic not just VMA's but one of the most iconic award show dresses and I mean that definitely creates a stir on the red carpet and gets attention. So what was right. your mindset to want to wear something like that if you don't like that sort of attention? Yeah. Well, one, I hadn't, I was still so young in my career at that point. I hadn't really articulated all the feelings and um, things that associated with it. But more importantly, it was my first big public appearance after being sexually assaulted. And I was like, you know, the movie Gladiator, when he comes out, and I just felt like, it, like, oh, Hollywood, you want a body just that you can use and throw away? I've got one for you. So it was like at the end of Gladiator when he comes out and he's like, are you not entertained? And if you look at me, I did it with power. I didn't do it with my hand on my hip to be sexy. That was later. But, you know, most of the women that have done, you know, homages or dressed kind of like that on the red carpet, it's. It's a calculated sexy move to turn people on. Mine was like, I'm going to f*** with your brain. 
I'm going to blow your brain up. And nobody had done it. And I was like, but I was kind of inspired also. I had been reading this book about a famous actress in the 30s. Um, and at one point she went down the red carpet at the Chinese theater in LA in an ambulance. And they took her out on a stretcher for her premiere because she was a big prankster and she had just medical tape covering her bits and pieces. But of course the publicists and the machines around to shut everything down. So nobody ever found out about it except in, in the biography and stuff. But I was like, oh, that is a punk move. That's very funny. So it was half humor, half are you not, more are you not entertained. It was more challenging and like really like, like how they love, they're always like over the shoulder. That's so they can get your butt and your face in the shot at the same time because that's extra money. It's gross. It's, it's, it doesn't, and again, I think if I'd always had dreams of stardom or things like that, maybe I would have had more of a shield and an endurance for it. But as it was, because I didn't have that feeling, it just felt really masochistic. And I'm like, what's the upshot of this? Yes, I can pay my rent and have a pretty house, but I'm, I'm largely miserable. Well, I didn't know that when you wore that chain mail VMA dress, that it was, as you say, the first time after, yeah. um, sorry if you've talked about this and did, did Marilyn Manson know what was going on? Cause obviously you were his, his date at the VMAs. Uh, I didn't realize yeah. that that had happened when you were with him. Like yeah, what was going it, on? It happened before, um, I went out with him about probably four or five months after it happened to me, maybe three months. Okay. And, um, you know, I would wake, I would have, I never told, I didn't tell him because what happens, I did tell him later. Well, he found out because he would ask my friend, what's wrong with this girl? She wakes up screaming at night and soaking wet in the bed and the sheets are wet. She does it every night, like two or three times a night. I would have terrible nightmares, uh, PTSD stuff now I know. Right. Um, so we had to talk about it then, but it was not, uh, and then he was really quite which he's recently apologized for, so that's nice. But he was really very nasty to me in the press for years after I broke up with him. Nasty, nasty, nasty. And that's just male ego bullshit with access to a microphone, I think. I'm not sure. But it was not cool. Um, but we're, we're settled. We're good now. It's all fine. Uh, but it was – he actually was very instrumental in healing for me at that point because I wanted to be young and free, and I felt so old. I'd been working, you know, my first job was at a funeral home when I was 14. I'd been working to support myself since then. And when I was 13, I was collecting cans on the street so I could eat, you know, turn them in for money. Um, I'd just been, like, working, it felt like, for so long. And I'd done, like, five movies in a row, and then the bad thing happened. And after that, I just wanted to run away with the circus and just feel free and have fun. And also because... People were like sending him death threats all the time and all that. It was more about me protecting him and I could focus on him instead of dealing with my own stuff. He was not aware when you made that splash on the red carpet on. Oh, yeah, he was. I, I didn't say. He, he knew the reasoning for the why to wear the dress? No, I think it was more of just like, this is punk. Let's cause a stir. But my reasoning. I mean, it was also looking back. I'm like, why did I do that? I've had to look at that. You know, when you do stuff sometimes on instinct and in a mood, like when a mood overtakes you later on, you analyze what it was that brought you to that mood or that choice. So I certainly had a lot of time to analyze. And then looking at the timeline, I completely understand why I did what I did. Were and you at any moment um, scared? Yes. Scared, but also when obviously it would be taken in a in a sexy way, like ooh, look at that hot oh, yeah, dress. They, look at they slut shamed me like crazy. Did you regret that then? It was kind of hard. I I hadn't really ever dealt with global media shaming, um, but it prepared me for later on it happening to me a whole bunch. So, you know, uh, it was also like, sorry, you're square, and I'm not bummer. <laughs> Well, obviously you have a, a thick skin, no pun intended, because you do obviously have some haters or whatever, but you, I'm surprised that you, you talk about social media and like the guy with the 43 followers, you know, reaching out to you. You're very active on social media, even though of course that is when you're a public figure, like a polarizing hey, public figure, it invites a lot of hate or ridicule or slut shaming or whatever. Like, I'm surprised that you're on it. social media. On Twitter, I'll drop a bomb, but then for like two or three days, I will not go on and look at the mentions. I won't look at the responses because that's too much for me. And I know it's going to stay stuff that, you know, 
even if you can like have the shield against bad things, it, a lot of them, if they're your bad thoughts that you've had yourself, they can slip through and hit and hurt you behind your armor, right? So I try to keep kind of a blackout on that stuff. It's kind of interesting. On Facebook, I noticed they're the worst spellers. Your and your is a real problem. <laughs> um, uh, one of my pet peeves. Uh, me too. And I'm like, whenever people are like, you're a slut. I'm like, no, it's Y-O-U apostrophe R-E a slut, you dummy. Uh, <laughs> Instagram is my softer side for sure. And my more artistic side and my more hopeful side. And Twitter is where, because I mostly just talk to the media there, um, because I'm trying to, the way they cover things really bothers me, you know, like they keep referring to Harvey Weinstein, fallen producer. I'm like, if he was a poor black man, would you start that article with convicted rapist? I bet you would. And it's about getting them to think differently. And like two years ago, the New York Times had a big headline. It's the 20th anniversary of the Monica Lewinsky scandal. And I was like, New York Times, change your headline. It's the 20th anniversary of the Bill Clinton scandal. Do not put it on women. You know, and it, it's like, it's just that kind of shifting of our mind. But right? it's just like taking your glasses and shifting them a little bit of how we see things and rearranging words because how we're treated in media, women especially, is how we're treated in the world. And it's not cool, it's not fun. And we can do better just by changing our language because language really affects people. How did you feel when, before he had his trial and before he went to jail, I seem to recall Weinstein was invited to some kind of improv workshop or, you know, like a showcase. And went to then- an, yeah. And- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, and but he was invited. And then when um, uh, one of the actresses or comedians on stage, Amber Rollo um, went after him and another one whose name I, I'm blanking out on right now, but they were very brave and they were scared and they for sure have been had their own experiences. So it's super triggering. And he's sitting there with like young women and people around him and everyone's like, you know, acting like, ooh, a rich producer's here. Like, what the hell is wrong with you people? What- yeah. And like, is was, being famous or getting a leg up that important? Like, seriously. Well, that, that was a moment where I thought to myself, oh, not as much has changed as I would have hoped or as I would have assumed. Do you think uh, four years ago, those two or three women that stood up to him would have done that publicly? That's, I don't. That's a, that's a good point, actually. You're right. And so that's that a huge amount of bravery. The rest are chicken <laughs> But they're brave. <laughs> right? Most, a lot of people are willing to trade their own comfort and dignity for what they think is a piece of the pie or access to celebrities, or I don't even know what the hell it is, frankly, because I don't think that way. But those women that stood up to him weren't. And I don't think four years ago, they would have, they would have just shoved it down. That's an optimistic way of, uh, of, I tend to be a uh, pretty optimistic person, weirdly enough. Yeah, I guess people wouldn't, uh, going back to what we were saying about the album being hopeful, maybe that is something people wouldn't have uh, assumed of you if they hadn't had a conversation with you or yeah, listened to the record. Yeah, that's the whole thing, you know. Um, people, the mainstream media, who I go up against regularly, has, you know, six conglomerates run by men. And they then it's run by powerful women and powerful men that's, and the women support a nasty power structure and they behave often in terrible, terrible ways. You know, we're seeing it with the media, with Tara Reid right now, what they're doing with the Biden thing. It's, it's unconscionable. And all the women like Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, uh, Stacey Abrams, you know, they didn't bring it up this weekend on, in their interviews and the interviewers didn't bring it up. There's a blanket of silence. CNN had, had the audio of Tara Reid's mom, who's accusing Joe Biden, the woman who I've talked to at length and deeply believe. And what's being done there by the mainstream liberal media, and I sound, if I say mainstream liberal media, like a, crazy, like a Republican, I'm neither. I don't like either of them, and I don't like groups. So I don't hold any allegiance to anybody. But um, at least the Republicans are up front with who they are. Like, Donald Trump's the most honest liar there is. He's like, yeah, I'm a liar. Suck it up. No, that wasn't me in the video. No, I didn't say that when there's clear evidence. So it's just bizarre. But whereas the people that are supposed to be the good guys, right, the thinking media, the Washington Post, for instance, or things like that, 
they're so deeply in with the DNC. They're so deeply enmeshed in the system. It's wild. And I'm like, this is your window. Everyone's like, oh, I wish it wasn't Biden. I wish we could have Cuomo. I'm like, you have a golden opportunity, dummies. Let's go. This is it. What are your hopes, fears, or predictions for this coming election then? I honestly, my response was to leave America. That is the only sane response I could have. I don't. um, If it's between Biden and Trump, that's a really grotesque choice. I don't feel that. And um, there's going to be a lot of people suffering uh, under this. I think Trump will win again. Um, But that's my feeling. But I also thought Harvey wasn't going to get convicted, so I could be wrong. Uh, (laughs) You know, I don't know. But I think it's a really terrible choice. And it sends a terrible message. And that all these apologist women and Alyssa Milano, he's a good man. Oh, really? Were you in that hallway with him when he stuck his finger up someone's dress? Were you? No, you weren't. Shut up. So are you staying in Mexico then? Not coming back? I'll go to Europe. And maybe India eventually. I feel like I've got about three or four more years in the Western world and then I'm out. Wow. Are you going to do any more music that maybe addresses what's going on in the world? Because... So the world is changing on a dime. Every every day there's a new wrinkle. There's new stuff to to write about and sing well, about. Well, in Planet Nine, I, I did write about the world. I just wrote about a better world that we can all get to, you know? Um, and I think if we constantly write about what is instead of what we can be, it doesn't offer us very much hope, does it? And so, or, or the ability to unthink traditional thought. Um, I think... You know, like that Variety review, I said, expected me to be screaming. And I'm like, oh, how basic. Um, it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not. And it was still shockingly a decent review, but it coming from them. But it was like, no, you don't really get it. It's not your expectation of me doesn't mean that I have to be that expectation. And neither should it be for anybody. So what? You know, if people look at you because you have, you know, fuchsia hair, and they're like, oh, she must be wild in bed. But you could be completely a cold fish. I don't know. Just, just using an example. You could be British that way. What do I know? Um, <laughs> you know, and it, it could give presuppositions about you. And people formulating ideas and thoughts about you. But really what you're saying is, no, I'm an individual. Take me as I am. And that's so a what beautiful is, message. What is Planet Nine, the place to, to go full circle as I said at the top of the interview, it sounds like a utopia I'd like to visit or move to. What does Planet Nine look like to you? What is this utopia that you would like to live in? You know, it would be letting people be the humans they were before they assigned them a gender, before they took their humanity and creativity away from them, before they told them to stay inside the lines, that only artists and musicians and painters are creative, that if you're an accountant, you're not creative, you fit into a box. None of that's true. You know, uh, what my Planet Nine looks like is like the lyrics in Green Gold, only here to paint colors on the sun, only here to see the fires run. And I think that means that we're here to just live a big life, a big emotional life. You know, don't let them take your, your emotional paint box. You know, don't let them take your colors away. Fight to keep those colors. Fight to keep who you are and then work on who you are. Because right now we have a really golden opportunity if we're not struggling for food or rent to really reset ourselves. And when we get out of these walls and we get to reintroduce ourselves to the public, we can be, you know, the 2.0 version of ourselves this time. We can be more human than we were last time. We can treat each other with more care and compassion and intelligence. We don't have to go back to the old system. This is a, a massive global reset. And unfortunately, the financial part of it is just going to probably kill more people in COVID. It's brutal and it's horrifying to imagine. It's, it's so, you know, I'm okay for a year, but then I really have to figure it out. So I've got a cushion. I'm grateful. Um, but Planet Nine is really just a place of healing and beauty and um, ultimately just an imaginary friend I wanted to share with the world. Well, I thank you for sharing it. It's a place I hope I get to visit for real sometime. I'm not yeah, thrilled with too. how things are down here right now, but I got to visit it through the album. So thank, thank you for you. that. Thank you for this conversation. This is friggin' amazing. I love yeah, talking I really to you. Yeah, I like talking to you. You're awesome. Oh, thank you, Go Rose. Thank you so hair. much. Wait, how are you doing your roots? Do you do it yourself? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I use a product called viral shampoo, which, uh, ironic, the name, uh, which <laughs> is kind of like a, a, 
shampoo with dye in it so that keeps it bright the roots i'm spraying with like fun color spray like halloween oh, you know smart. like spray that kind of just i've been staring at roots it? going like oh she <laughs> Is she breaking quarantine? No, I'm just kidding. No, no, I'm doing that myself. The bangs, though, I got to cut at some point. They're getting a little long. Yeah, I've just been putting a lot of conditioner in my hair and slicking it back. And my dog uh, is growing her her hair. She just looks like a mop right now because there's no... Wait, let me find her. Pearl, come here, baby. Pearl. (laughs) It's Pearl. Oh, what's her name? Pearl. She's, so She's cute. actually my emotional support dog. Um, I was like prescribed her. Oh wow! She seems like a good prescription. Pets are good right now. I have a cat somewhere and a snake over there. Oh, that's cool. What's your snake's name? White snake. Of course. <laughs> She's white. So I go do- can on my own. Got the reference. But having there pets go. is, is good when you live alone. It helps especially. a lot. Yeah. Well, take care of yourself. Yeah. Stay safe down there. I envy you're in the jungle. It seems like a nice place to be. It is. And stay safe, sweetheart. Thank you. Enjoy talking to you. Take care. Enjoy talking to you. Bye. Bye.